You're listening to Clinician's Roundtable on ReachMD. On this episode, we'll hear from Dr. Jay Fishman about the current state of xenotransplantation, where he'll discuss the infectious risks of transplantation and strategies for prevention. Dr. Fishman is the Director of Transplant Infectious Diseases and Compromised Host Program at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He'll be presenting on this topic at ID Week 2023. Here's Dr. Fishman now. In the early era, when we first raised questions about the infectious risk of xenotransplantation, we identified a number of potential pathogens, including the porcine endogenous retrovirus, which my lab cloned and sequenced, and put a damper on things for a while because of concerns about infectious risk. The ability to knock out PERV genetically using CRISPR-Cas9 and other advances such as the availability of antiretroviral medications, which could treat it if infection occurred, helped to reopen a field at a time when a number of companies were getting interested again in developing pigs as potential organ donors for humans. The background is very simple. We have a dramatic shortage of organs for people with end-stage organ failure. And pigs were of appropriate size, easier to breed, didn't carry some of the infectious risks associated with primates, and so had been a choice for a long period of time as a potential for human transplantation. There were and are some immunologic barriers which required research and some new innovation in immunosuppression that would allow these organs to be accepted by humans. And what has now happened with genetic manipulation is that some of the immunologic barriers, the metabolic barriers, particularly surrounding coagulation, and some of the infectious disease barriers have been overcome using genetic tools, which allows consideration of clinical trials. With the improvement of immunosuppression and with the improvement of our knowledge in infectious disease, people were becoming poised to begin studies. And you may have seen what we call the decedent studies, the people who have volunteered their bodies after their death for use in studies, where kidneys and hearts have been transplanted in by groups at NYU at the University of Alabama to see if they would be acutely rejected or if any metabolic incompatibilities existed. And these organs survived quite well. In the midst of those kinds of studies was the first and now the second heart transplant at the University of Maryland, where surprisingly the first recipient who was quite deconditioned and quite ill going into transplant and had a series of complications as well, did quite well, lived for 61 days. And the second gentleman apparently is doing also quite well and is off various forms of support. So this is all very exciting. Those were done on a compassionate basis, and so not as part of formal clinical trials, but as a prelude to doing clinical trials. There are always concerns in animal studies, and there are concerns about any new technology, but the concern that has galvanized, if you will, the public the most is the infectious disease concern. And those are manageable concerns. It's not that infection won't occur as long as you're using immunosuppression, The prediction based on our experience in allotransplantation is that infections will occur based on exposures in the environment, based on pre-existing infections in the individual who's being transplanted. So we've been studying those for years. In some ways, what we're missing are clinical trials. We need to know more about each of the areas. So for example, an infectious disease, we need to know that the breeding characteristics of given pigs are adequate for human use. Now, there are multiple different places that are deriving their pigs in different ways. And so each one of those birds needs to be verified in terms of any infectious risk they may pose for immunosuppressed humans, because the immunosuppression is what's going to determine infectious risk in addition to the organisms. In terms of immunology, we need longer term graphs in humans with the human immune system to see whether or not these organs can survive if there is a response from the human to reject the graft. And metabolically, we need to see that various organs can do, in particular, the liver and the kidney, but the heart also has metabolic functions, that whether those metabolic functions are adequate to sustain a sick human being. 
so that in the absence of human clinical trials, there are things we are missing where there are just going to be questions until we go into humans. I think the key takeaways are this. We've learned a lot about the immunology of xenotransplantation. And as a result, we've established very good immunosuppressive regimens for eventual application in clinical xenotransplantation. So that's one. The second is, based on what we've seen so far in primates, these organs are able to sustain the primates and to work for years in place of the normal organs. I think the infectious disease risks are manageable, but we know that any immunosuppressed human is at risk for infection from the environment and from the hospital environment. And therefore, we're going to take an approach where we monitor those recipients for infectious disease. And I think the last part is infection control. We need to provide for the safety of the staff, for the recipients, and for the community to be sure that there is no adverse infectious risk that's posed to the community. I think those are the take-home messages. I think these are manageable as long as we do things carefully. That was Dr. Jay Fishman discussing his 2023 ID Week session on xenotransplantation. To access this and other episodes in our series, visit Clinician's Roundtable on ReachMD.com, where you can be part of the knowledge. Thanks for listening.